In this video, I want to introduce the concepts of vectors and dual vectors. And just so you know, both of these entities have different names that sometimes they're called in sort of books or literature. Vectors are also known as contravariant vectors, whereas dual vectors are sometimes known as covariant vectors. An alternative name for dual vectors that is often used, partly to emphasize the fact that dual vectors aren't really what we're used to as vectors, is something which is known as a one-form. Okay, let's start off by discussing vectors. So we're going to imagine that we have a surface, and on that surface we have defined a set of coordinates, or particular axes of coordinates, which looks something like this. So a given point on this particular surface is given by the sort of various coordinates, so x0, x1, etc. We're imagining that you know this could potentially be a surface in a higher dimensional space. So as a shorthand here, we refer to the individual coordinate as x mu. So here, mu is equal to 0, 1, 2, etc. We're going to imagine that at a particular point on this surface, there is a particle, and that particle has a velocity, and that velocity we can represent as a vector, which looks something like that. Now, the components of that velocity vector we can write as v mu is equal to the derivative of that particular coordinate with respect to time. So on our graph, what we have here is we, we can sort of find the various components of that vector along the coordinate axes, and they might look something like that, which I'm indicating here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to imagine that we change coordinates. So perhaps our coordinate lines look something like this in the new graph. So these are quite obviously different to the previous coordinates uh, or the sort of coordinate um, grid that we drew before. However, our vector, which is a physical quantity of velocity, doesn't change. It's still exactly the same as it was before. However, the various components of that velocity vector are going to change because now we see that because our coordinate axes have shifted, we're going to get different components. And these are now going to lie along the new coordinate axes. And the question we have is, what do these components of velocity look like in the transformed reference frame? By transformed reference frame here, I just mean a sort of new set of coordinates, x0 primed, x1 primed, etc which we're going to denote as a shorthand by x mu primed, where again mu is going to run from 0, 1, 2, etc. So what we want to find now is the components of the velocity in the primed frame. So what we have here is we know that this is just equal to the derivative of x mu primed with respect to time, which we can calculate using the chain rule. That's just equal to dx mu primed over dx mu times dx mu over dt. So the reason that we've decomposed it like this is that this second component here is what we had calculated as the component of the velocity in the original reference frame. And we see here that because the dx mu's are going to effectively cancel, we're going to get exactly what we want out. Anyway, so I'm just going to remove those crosses now so that we can see the formula in its full form. And we know on the right here, we're actually using the Einstein summation convention. We're actually summing over the different values of mu because we've got mu repeated in the right-hand expression here. So just writing out that expression again, we have this formula here. But then we note that this thing on the right-hand side here is really just v mu. So what we have here 
for our vector is that the components of the velocity in the primed frame are equal to the derivative of x mu primed with respect to x mu times the velocity in the unprimed frame. And this relationship here that we've written down is the definition of how a vector behaves. It transforms exactly like this. Remember, in doing this, we are only considering the components of the vector. The vector itself doesn't depend on the particular coordinates that we use. We are looking at the components. Now we're going to consider a different sort of entity, which are known sometimes as dual vectors. So again, we're going to imagine that we have a surface, and on that surface, we have a particular scalar field. And the scalar field that I'm going to use as an example here is the electric potential. On the surface, as before, we're going to imagine that we have coordinates, particular coordinate axes that look something like this. And on that surface, we have our electric potential, which we can represent as contour lines of constant values of electric potential. Using these first axes, we're imagining that we've got sort of coordinates x0, x1, etc. And what we can do using this first uh, coordinate axis is we can evaluate the gradient of our electric potential, which I'm going to represent here as phi, with respect to one of the coordinates, which I'm going to call here x mu. And just for your information here, the gradient of the electric potential with respect to one of the coordinates is just the definition of the electric field, e mu, which I'm just going to write it as here. The question then becomes, if we transform to a different set of coordinates, how do the components of our electric field actually transform? So we're going to imagine now that we have a different set of axes, which perhaps look something like this. And we have, remember, you know, the physics doesn't change. We've still got exactly the same lines of electric potential here. But the question now becomes, what do the components of the electric field look like in our transformed reference frame? where we're using a set of coordinates, you know, x mu primed, which is just sort of x0 primed, x1 primed, etc. So what we're after here is e mu primed, which is just the derivative of phi with respect to x mu primed, which we can obtain again using the chain rule. That's just dx mu with respect to x mu primed times d phi over d x mu. So that we see here again, we can get the components in the new reference frame by using the components in the old reference frame, d phi over d x mu. And hence we see that we can write a rule here for how the components transform e mu primed is equal to d x mu over d x mu primed times e mu. And this sort of entity that behaves like this, or transforms like this rather, is the definition of a dual vector. So how does this differ from the behavior of a vector? Well, remember we found that v, v mu primed is equal to d x mu primed over dx mu times v mu. And we can see here that the derivative part of this expression is different. For the vectors, it's dx mu primed, the new coordinates with respect to the old ones. And for the dual vectors, it's the other way around. It's the inverse of that. To make it clear what sort of object we're dealing with, we use superscripts here to denote the cases of when we're dealing with a vector and the subscripts here to make clear that we're actually dealing with something which is known as a dual vector.
And as I said before, a dual vector is really actually best thought of, not really as a vector, but as something which is known as a one form that we'll discuss in due course.